Well, good afternoon, everyone. We'll start um, any moment from now. And um, if you're not here within uh, Africa, I should be saying good morning. And if you are anywhere else in Asia, I should be saying good evening. But welcome, all of you. You know, you don't see emails. No, no, I. Yes, you can. The thing is, even if I send you what I have, it's not the it's not the link. Hello everyone, it's wonderful to have all of us here today. All right, we'll just get started. And um, would you make a Um 
were looking at 55 years back. Dr. Clarice Gabo and his wife came to Nigeria in the hopes of making contact to lay the foundation for his work. Little, I think, did he know how big, how long, and versatile the outcome of his visit will be. Today, very many years on, we're here to celebrate that little beginning that blossomed into the hub of services for humanity that today is Pathfinder International. I would like to add Nigeria. In so many decades, individuals, men, women, boys and girls, communities with neither ethnic nor religious borders in thousands, if not in millions, have been impacted with long lasting results. Through all the turbulence of politics, wars, insurgencies, ethnic clashes, religious clashes, diseases, epidemics, or even pandemic, as we know it today, Pathfinder International Nigeria is marching on and waxing stronger indeed. Today, this monumentally eclectic composition and conglomeration of tribes and peoples that is the Nigerian nation. We're here to celebrate a workforce that has adversely affected the unitary aim of doing good and improving the lives of people. We're here to celebrate the entity that binds all of us together in one big thriving force for adding values to lives here in Nigeria. Here soon to unfold before us all is a celebration of living fruitful, impactful, and dignifying lives in Nigeria. So therefore, I, Mujima Kojola, in all humility and a lot of awe of the journey so far, bid you welcome to this important milestone, Pathfinder International Nigeria at 55. Welcome, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I can tell you that my joy is full because we are celebrating an event that started small but has uh, catapulted to a global recognition, a national recognition. So it is a joy and with a sense of pride that I welcome all of us here today. Now, this is going to be very interactive. It's going to be all of us together. As it is, I can see about 109 participants already. We expected about 300 plus. And so, and it's going to be global. So wherever you are, you're welcome. Now, please just let's quickly remind ourselves that uh, when you are not speaking, we expect that you are muted. And um, we have a few rules here and there, which we speak to. Please, all the questions that you need to ask, take them to the Q&A boxes and, of course, the chat box. We would monitor and ensure that when we have the interactive session, everyone, everyone, uh, will have a voice. That's what Pathfinder is all about, finding a way where there is either no way or where it is difficult to reach or where there is a way. So we're going to have a wonderful two hours together and I do hope that um, all of us would be very involved and very attentive. Um, the, the topics, would, I would introduce them as the common and as well as um, our versatile resources who have been involved in anything they're talking about. And our topic today is one, and our topic today is one that um, is very, uh, is putting everyone together. We're talking about evolution of sexual and reproductive health in Nigeria, the past, the present, and the future. When you talk of sexuality in Nigeria, it becomes imperative that everyone gets to know how far we've gone and how far we are making it. Okay, um, um, as we start today, let's start from home. And that's uh, Pathfinder International Headquarters where we have uh, our sister waiting to actually welcome us in as it were. I'd like to introduce that we have with us a member of Pathfinder's board since 2009 and current board chair, Rosalind Watson, is the president and founder of Watson Ventures, a company that invests 
in commercial and residential real estate projects in the Boston and Paris market and provides counsel to US investors seeking French real estate opportunities. She is an active independent board member, currently serving on the board of directors of American Express Bank, the Dreyfus Laurel Mutual Funds and the Dreyfus Mellon Cash Management Funds and a trustee of Sims College. She previously served on the board of the Massachusetts Electric Company, Hydro One, and the SBLI US Life Insurance Company, as well as a trustee of the Hyams Foundation. Rosalind is one of the eight founders of New England Women in Real Estate. Her awards include the Women, Women of Achievement Award from the Boston Big Sister Association, the Boston Black Achiever Award from the Boston YM CA and the Working Woman of the Year Award from Working Women Magazine. Uh, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me invite with such pride, Rosalind Weston. You have the floor, ma'am. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. It's a miracle of technology that we're all together because I greet you from the far west of the United States. And I bring you not only the greetings, but the congratulations of the Pathfinder Board of Directors. Nigeria has been a significant part of Pathfinder since the beginning of our organization. The Pathfinder way, working hand in hand with communities and public health systems to allow women, men, and young people to live their fullest and healthiest <coughs> sexual and reproductive lives was pioneered in Nigeria. It was developed and refined in Nigeria and continues to evolve to be even more innovative and impactful in Nigeria. It was in Nigeria in 1988, the Pathfinder led Africa's then largest family planning and reproductive health program, working with government partners to establish national systems for data collection and, and systems to manage contraceptive supplies. This work was the foundation for all the family planning programs conducting worldwide to, to, to today. And this critical infrastructure thinking and building started in Nigeria. At the same time, Pathfinder's <clears throat> programs in Nigeria have modeled working in close partnership with traditional business, <clears throat> traditional and business and religious leaders, community health workers, young people, mothers and fathers. Our Nigerian programs demonstrated that this is the path that advances reproductive health and rights that last. As much today as is a well-deserved 55th birthday celebration, I'm also struck with how this webinar has been planned to not just explore where Pathfinder Nigeria has been, but what it can be in the future. I salute that and I look forward to our partnership together as Pathfinder evolves. In the countries where Pathfinder works now, 18 around the world, many crises have, have uh, arisen. Today we are ex experiencing concurrent crises in the world, some driven by the pandemic, uh, the severe impacts of climate change, and the global warming uh, that we're experiencing around the, around the globe. And there's a, glow, a growing realization across the world that extreme economic disparity and systemic racism really corrode civic life and get in the way of our, and threaten our future. Is this a reckoning moment? I wonder, I hope so. At times like this, sometimes it's really hard to know where to start. But being a pathfinder is critical and we need to challenge ourselves to use this moment to evolve. Over 55 years, Nigeria has been central to the evolution of Pathfinder and I very much look forward to our work together as Pathfinder continues to evolve. The lessons learned here have not only provided a foundation for this country, for Nigeria, but has seeded Pathfinder programs elsewhere and been a real model providing thought leadership to our organization. 
We're poised to continue to evolve as Pathfinder is a leading organization in our space. And I look forward to our work together. I want you to know that the, that the board <clears throat> of Pathfinder has initiated two major initiatives uh, to really leverage this moment. We've undertaken an intentional effort to expand our board and deepen our skills so that our board better reflects the organization that we are today. We look forward to welcoming new members in the coming months that will bring fuller <clears throat> understanding of the places that we work and the skills that we will need to guide Pathfinder going forward. Our organization is also undertaking an intentional review of our structure so that we can evolve our structure to, to reflect Pathfinder as it exists now and not as it has been <laughs> for 55 years. You will be hearing more details about these initiatives as they unfold. Again, I want to celebrate this day with you. It's a privilege that technology allows us to be together. And I look forward to learning more about your, the past, the present, and your ideas for the future of Pathfinder. So congratulations, and we salute you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Rosalind. And uh, it is indeed a reckoning time where we are reflecting and also thinking towards uh, a better and a more productive uh, future with Pathfinder International Nigeria. So celebration of good things that has happened. Thank you. Now, we quickly would uh, like uh, to ask uh, the president and chief executive, Pathfinder International, Lois Kwam, who is going to address us next. She is next to address us and um, as soon as she come on, I would just like quickly to say to you that she has been named three times to Fortune list of the most influential women leaders in business. Let's go on, join uh, Pathfinder in 2017 as the chief executive officer. She brings in a lifelong passion for women's empowerment and lessons learned as a senior leader in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors. Throughout her career, she has applied her strategic and operating experiences to drive business revenue and earnings growth and tackle public policy issues. Before joining Pathfinder, Lloyd served as the Chief Operating Officer of the Nature Conservancy and a Senior Advisor to Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. She was selected by President Obama to head his signature global health initiative at the Department of State. Prior to her work in the public sector, Lois was the founding chief executive officer of Ovations, a division of the Fortune 50 Global Corporation United Health Group. I'm pleased to bring Lois on the microphone and I hope you'll all join me to welcome her warmly. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here with you today to celebrate Pathfinder's 55 years in Nigeria. I want to begin by expressing my deep respect, um, admiration, and appreciation for the Pathfinder leadership and team in Nigeria today, and for the distinguished set of Pathfinder leaders and team members who have served these past 55 years. Pathfinder in Nigeria throughout these 55 years and today does what we do. We go to the places that are most difficult, the places that are most in need, bringing health and well being. We do that to make sure that every woman has the opportunity to make the most crucial choices in her life when, if, and how many children to have so that she can participate fully in her life. I'm proud of so many things in our 55 years of history, but one of the things that always stands out for me is the work that Pathfinder did really very early in Pathfinder Nigeria to continue to provide services during the Biafran Civil War. Many international reproductive health and other health organizations stopped and left Nigeria during that period. But Pathfinder Nigeria, led by Nigerians, 
stayed in Nigeria and continued to provide services during the Civil War and during the important period afterwards. That vital work provided the basis for Pathfinder's work across Nigeria. And as our board chair, Rosalind Watson, just shared, for Pathfinder and reproductive health more broadly. At Pathfinder, we don't do anything on our own. Everything we do is through partnerships with community leaders, with women and men, with religious leaders, with government leaders and others. These partnerships are, allow us, are what allow us to serve the men and women and girls and boys in Nigeria. And today we wanna to say especially that we treasure all of you who are here today as our partners. I wanna particularly note with excitement the over $1 million that is in the current budget in Cross River State and Lago State for family planning. That's an achievement and it's an achievement we made together across these fine partnerships. So in close, we look to Pathfinder Nigeria to provide leadership, not only in Nigeria for the important work around family planning, but to teach all of us what we need to do globally to confront this moment, this demanding moment. We've been in the demanding moments before, and we know that as Pathfinders, we'll find the path. Congratulations on this anniversary. It's an honor to be your colleague and celebrate it with you. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Lois. And um, I share with you uh, the dreams and aspirations of continuing to find the path to yes. cross over and get things done. And that's what Pathfinder is all about. And you have emphasized that. Thanks for your, uh, being mm -hmm. with us. So we go straight now to the uh, very first um, um, speaker. And um, uh, each time I speak about him, I'm a bit emotional because he steers my emotion with all the places that we've had to crisscross in this country to ensure that our women and our children are reached with uh, some measure of quality health. Let me introduce Mike Ebo. I think um, here back home, we, 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 we speak to him as Father Pathfinder, because he's the longest serving PI staff in Nigeria, 22 years, and um, he's still working along finding the path to the promised land. And so, but today, Mike is the country director, Kemonix PSM Project Nigeria. However, for more than 25 years, he's been a wonderful leader, a visionary, an activist, and an educator who has focused his work his um, everything around him on breaking cultural and religious barriers, effective health outcomes. I describe him as a passionate advocate for reproductive health, family planning, uh, maternal and child health. And um, it's so difficult to speak about maternal and child care in Nigeria without bringing on Mike Ebo. And so thank you for coming. Uh, the floor is yours, and I think today you are indeed a very happy man. Over to you. Okay. Uh, good morning from here, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be alive, and I thank God for this opportunity, and I welcome every one of you. Um, yeah. So I will be talking today, um, the time we have is not enough for me to talk about 55 years of service. But I will do it within the time that I'm allotted. If you look at the background, it shows the part. I say a part of honor. Next slide. You know, um, my mother died in the labor room after delivery several years ago, precisely 1975 at a time when she should not have been pregnant because she could not negotiate with my father. So it was the right issue. Another a final year medical student in one of our best higher institution um, also committed suicide because she became pregnant. She had passed her final exam. She was already a doctor. She got pregnant because they went to this party, they misbehaved, and then she got pregnant. 
But because she thought she was going to bring shame to her family, she took an overdose of chloroquine and died after seven years of medical training. In, an, in a CSM epidemic, which I was involved in, as we were going through the city, uh, the city center advocating and telling people to bring out people who were sick, we met a woman who lost three children. This woman had nine children. Three of them died in one night. She did not even know they were dead. And uh, when we asked her, well, where, where? It's like I had nine. Nine minus three. I have a balance of six. So for her, it was a game of numbers, which is ignorance. This is what defined me. This is what made me to join Pathfinder when they advertised for that position. Next slide. Well, we say at Pathfinder, never a dull moment. You know, Pathfinder is a passion. It's a way of life. It's not a job you come into because you want your bills paid. You, I joined Pathfinder because of my vision, of my passion. My vision was to do work in reproductive health, in family planning, to make sure that other women don't die the way my mother died in the labor room. And at Pathfinder, we said, never a dull moment. At Pathfinder, you were an explorer. We explored. We navigated. We were change agents. There are communities we went to too. There's a community in the eastern part of Nigeria where it was a pride for you to have the 10th child. And when you have the 10th child, they either kill a goat or they kill a cow to celebrate you. But when you look at those children, some of them were very malnourished. Several women died in the process of trying to have 10 children. I went into that community and I was given two hours to quit or they will kill me. Uh, this report is in the Guardian. It was a center page. It was reported. But we were called back to work with the community, and that has changed today. At Pathfinder, we were also capacity builder, and we were life transformer. Next slide. I'm going to be moving fast because time is of essence. The journey, how did it begin? In 1965, Pathfinder gave a grant to the late Professor Liko Yeransom Kuti, uh, the global Mr. Uh, primary healthcare, to study family planning in remote Sokoto at the time, in 1965. First grant. There were so many other things, Pathfinder traveling from Boston into Nigeria to do work. But I just highlighted some of them. One was supporting the establishment of Planned Parenthood Federation of Nigeria. Pathfinder provided the grant that established that foundation that is uh, PPFN today. Uh, in 1985, a formal office was opened in Nigeria. And then, of course, uh, the first thing was a lot of training gaps. People did not have information that advocacy, knowledge gap, technical gap. And so the first thing was to support the fertility, the creation of the Fertility Research Center, UCH, Ibadan. Uh, the principal character there were Professor Ladipo, my dear brother, and if everybody know him, and Chief Dr. Mrs. Grace Ebundelano, who is popularly referred to as Obiri Atata. That's a Yoruba word for a woman of substance. You know, so she's that, for that respected. And she's also uh, called in, um, um, in the, even though she's about 90 now, she's called Sweet Sustain. In addition, in order to make sure that the country was covered, uh, we established centers of excellence. You know, family planning training programs were established at the University College Hospital in Ibadan, all the major teaching hospitals in Nigeria, Lagos, in Benin, in Elorin, in Enugu, in Port Harcourt, in Zaria, in Jos, in Ife, which is now OAU. Training centers were established for training of nurses and doctors. We actually helped in 
refurbishing building, in creating room, improving infrastructures in these uh, teaching hospitals, while at the same time we were doing advocacy. And in 19, I think it's 1995, you, uh, the US government dissatisfied Nigeria because of drug issues. And so everybody pulled out of Nigeria, but Pathfinder remained. I was asked, I was only the person left with my secretary to close out the office. We had three months of grace to close out the office. But within that three months, we were, I was able to develop a proposal that was given to Ford Foundation. Pathfinder has never worked with Ford Foundation. And so we got $600,000 from Ford Foundation West African Regional Office to work to develop Hard to Reach initiative. Actually, this Hard to Reach initiative was developed for USAID, but it couldn't be funded. And so Ford took it over. And that took us to Nembe Creeks in the Niger Delta. Nobody had been there. Nembe Creeks, you have what they call the Ashewo Village. Ashewo Village was created to provide commercial sex work to Shell Camp. On the other side of the river, we had the Shell Flow Station. Uh, you would think you are in London because they had everything, even though it's a rural area. But every weekend, you have prostitutes moving from Port Harcourt to go there. It's a four hour boat ride. It's not land. You're on a flying boat for four hours. It's that far in a creek. We went there and established services there. We established clinics. We established a um, ski building uh, center in that place. We are photographed to that site to tell you how, what it is to be a pathfinder. Shell could not believe that what they saw, that development could take place right in front of their nose. You know, but we did it. And Shell, the day we launched the program, Shell came with cameras from London to take pictures. And the first thing they did was to take our staff, our program staff, to establish what is now the biggest department in Shell Petroleum Development in Nigeria as the Community Development Department. That department evolved as a result of the work we did at the, um, in the Niger Delta. And to give you one song, I never thought of this, but when I went there with the president of Pathfinder and the then chairman of the board, he was surprised that we traveled. He asked me, say, Mike, what were you doing when you came to this place? Because he was on the boat with me for about two and a half hours. We took a shorter cut. When we arrived, the communities had these songs. Say, Pathfinder has done it. Pathfinder has done it. What shell cannot do? Pathfinder has done it. We basically said, what Shell could not do, Shell Petroleum, with all their money, Pathfinder has done it. That's how far we were doing Pathfinder job. Next slide. The journey. I already talked about Professor Ransom Kuti. We established, uh, supported the establishment of PPFN, uh, country offices. This, no, you're repeating the slide. Next slide. I've already done. Okay, major primary efforts. I think one thing we must know that in addition to, we were very creative and innovative because for me, nothing could stop us from doing what we needed to do. And so even within Pathfinder International, Pathfinder Nigeria was the first country office to work with Ford Foundation, with Makato Foundation, with Packard Foundation, with DFID, with Japanese JICA, and we see that Canadian. At one point, we had eight donors. No other development partner had that amount of uh, donors. So uh, Pathfinder established worked in the public sector of the Family Health Services uh, project, which was a 100 million grant. It was the biggest, you say, grant in Africa at the time. You know, working with in all the states of the federal zone, all the family planning coordinators, the armed forces, police, all the tertiary hospitals were all involved. We are all over the country. And then we also work with four foundations, the Heart to Reach, I already talked about that. The first HIV project in Nigeria 
the first major one, and that was also Pathfinder's intro to HIV work. Because when I was doing this, and I was being told that, oh, this is not our niche, this is not, but we got it. And uh, the first major project, supported by DFID, implemented in Benue and Ogo State, was implemented by Pathfinder. That was what the face of HIV in Nigeria. It was widely reported by television, was widely visited by different organizations, FHI and all that, and other development uh, projects, World Bank. And that's how HIV program started. So it, Pathfinder was the first. Uh, Mercator Foundation also supported us in working in the Niger Delta uh, region on environment and health project in Patani area of the Niger Delta. And then ACAD supported private sector initiative in the North. This was the groundbreaking uh, of family planning services in the North. We met, there is no EMEA that was not involved that we did not meet. Our advocacy was impeccable. We were able to reach uh, every, every nook and cranny. Where the Federal Ministry of Health were not allowed to hold uh, family planning workshop in Sokoto, Pathfinder was welcomed. We had a workshop. Not only that, we had a workshop. The state government gave us a state banquet in the evening with traditional dances. That's how far we work with Pathfinder. And then also, um, Makato, in terms of going into ELD uh, programs, you know, we, we, ELDP is Emerging Leaders Development Program. You know, uh, we got to a point where we like, if people who were there, all these uh, persons that we have trained at the tertiary institutions, all uh, the senior persons were going to be retiring and some of them were retiring, how do we replace them? So we work with Makato Foundation to establish a leadership training program as emerging leaders. And I can tell you some of those leaders are in different areas today. They are leaders in Africa. Some of the, one of them is a chief of party in Liberia, you know. So we have actually evolved. Every person that participated, thanks to Makato, are in leadership position, uh, position in reproductive health today. And what was really dear to my heart was that the, pres the then president of Makato came to Nigeria. He said, he met with me at the Hilton and said, Mike, if I give you four million, what will you do with it? And I gave a proposal and we started talking about anti-shock garment. For those of you who know what it is, it enables you to save a woman's life until it gets to help to keep the blood in the upper part of the body that is required. That is what my mother needed that she did not get. So when that happened, I said, yes, I have arrived. Now I know that there is a system or there is a mechanism that we can use or a procedure that we can take that will save other women from dying the way my mother died. So I felt very good when that uh, grant was given to us and it was announced during Women Deliver in London. And then one other thing we did was, uh, the other major project was Compass, which was education and health and uh, so in the social sector. Uh, that was over a $100 million project. Uh, like the president of Pathfinder said earlier on, it was in partnership with MSH, with Johns Hopkins, you know, uh, with different groups. Uh, the HIV work already talked about it. Uh, then we have to work with the, we work with the, sorry, this is a different one. This was the second HIV project because of our success that the Canadian government funded, looking at the hot spot where we had, um, uh, where we had, uh, what do you call them, transport workers uh, hobnobbing. Next slide, I will soon round up. And then institutional strengthening uh, is another thing that we did. Um, you will find today we, the family planning MIS form that we have today was developed by Pathfinder. We developed a national network of trainers, established a training center in Benin. Most of the best trainers we have in Nigeria today belong to that group, and they remain in Nigeria to sustain training. We have NGO manual. Then the other thing is the best traditional birth 
attendance training manual with Islamic principles is now in use in Sudan. I took it to Sudan, the Sudanese government adopted it as their training manual. Then, of course, we managed international fault fellowship for uh, people without systematic access or education, scholarship to uh, masters and PhDs. A number of them are professors in US, UK now. And then I already talked about ELDP. Next slide. I'm going to just one more slide and I'll be done. Um, all right, then we, one important thing we did, like, because like I, we talk about innovation, we funded Parliamentarian for Global Action based in New York to support Nigerian legislators moving, uh, Nigerian le legislators going to Ghana to meet the Ghana, Ghanaian Parliament and study the Pop Council Navro Group project. We gave that grant, and that is why today we have PGA members in the House of Assembly. We also supported Council of Ulamas to Bangladesh. They came back uh, to talk about family planning, and as a result of that, a book was published. Uh, we also supported women group to Senegal. We supported ad uh, adult, uh, young youths to South Africa. Um, next slide. So in Pathfinder, just to summarize, I rushed through. In Pathfinder, we touched life. We changed lives. We restored hopes. We provided a voice for the voiceless. We strengthened families. We took risk. We took risk. We took risk. And we created an enabling environment, enabling platform for the implementation of r programs. r programs is going on in Nigeria today because of the groundbreaking work of Pathfinder. Today, I want to salute all that contributed to what is today known as Pathfinder legacies. I will not end this without thanking uh, the then president, uh, Daniel Pellogram, we call him Dan, Dan Pellogram, for providing us that support, for being passionate because he came and he saw and he visited almost all the projects here. I want to thank the government of Nigeria, the private sector, the civil society, uh, Mojima Konjola, who is anchoring this today because we were in the 20s together and we still remain in the 20s together. God bless all of you and thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mike Ebo, uh, taking us through a journey of uh, 22 years in about six, seven minutes. Thank you so very much. Um, I think what I, I would like to leave us with is the fact that Pathfinder restores hope. And hope is what we want to continually restore so that together we can build better health outcomes for all people. Um, we're on and um, one thing I can say is uh, even the weather is celebrating with Pathfinder. Here where we are in Abuja, the federal capital territory, it is pouring, but we are saying that it is, uh, we're getting showers of blessings to continue to find those hard to reach areas where everyone would uh, be reached and also be given and hopes will be restored. Our next speaker has shown passion beyond his crown. His Royal Highness, Dr. Hali Ruyahia, Emir of Shonga. Um, he, uh, Shonga is in a local government area of Kwara State. He has been former chairman of National Primary Healthcare Development Agency. He advocated for proper attention to primary health care, proper funding of the sector, the view to ensuring qualitative health care services for the people. I worked very closely with His Royal Highness during the very difficult days of polio eradication initiative. Only yesterday, Nigeria got uh, uh, a polio-free certificate from World Health Organization. So for him, it's double celebration. As I invite to the microphone, a strong advocate of health, maternal and child health, and indeed public health. His Royal Highness, I call him my father, 
because we come from the same state, Inquara State. And he has many firsts in, on his crown. I think that the best community health um, service is, is working. There he is, the uh, royal head of that community. Please welcome with me most gladly the mayor of Shunga in the local government area of Kwara State, His Royal Highness, Dr. Khalil Yahaya. Sir, you have the microphone. Thank you very much, Modi. Uh, let me start by saying that it's always an anticlimax to speak after uh, Mike Ebu. I will still do my best, but I think I want to start by appreciating the invitation to this uh, celebration. As Moji said, um, we also had to celebrate our certification yesterday, so it's double celebration. My association with Pathfinder has gone on for over 30 years. And Mike was the person in saddle. He saw me somehow, got attracted and said, you think you might be useful material. Why? I'm a medical doctor and uh, almost a gynecologist. I shared, shared, I shared that and went somewhere else. But then he was, you know, very inspirational. Like you can see, nearly all those within the whole there are Nigerians have been cloned by him, virtually. They were brought up by him, capacity built. And the number of people in this country who have been touched in terms of capacity building by is endless. He's already summarized everything himself. I would like to call him here, father of reproductive health in Nigeria. He actually stimulated the first health policy by working hard with the ministry, actively involved in that. And that was the beginning, the beginning of the turning point. The journey has no doubt been very interesting, very long, very torturous, full of lacuna, and, uh, but he's going to be able to navigate all that. So but maybe Pathfinder Navigator International. Need we say more? The resistance to reproductive health issues, particularly in the northern part of the country where I come from and uh, whose religion I share, the majority of you I share, is unbelievable. And this kind of um, stereotypes have gone on for many years to find everything you've seen and people are prepared to stay how they were without necessarily having to close changes. The girls were voiceless, the women had no, little no voice and the productive issues uh, consumed lives. Now, um, Islamic scholars had a field day because they were having their own type of interpretations of reproductive health issues in particular, in addition to other issues. Well, um, let me start by saying, in course of our interaction with, with um, the Ebo, we had to send a group of Islamic scholars, ulama, they call them, alim is one, ulama, plural, to Bangladesh that has 98% Muslims who are already well on the path to reproductive health uh, changes, the, the family planning, the lot. And so after a stint there, a few days, you now had to come and have a rethink. Uh, at the dissemination session, which I was very fortunate to chair, because I had understanding on both sides of the story, the medical side and the, uh, the, the Islamic side, uh, it was quite an eye-opener. Eventually, um, when the transfer was all Western idea, Western ideas, but they saw things, and so we asked them, what's your own agenda? If that's Western agenda, what's your agenda? And that was the beginning of a long walk to the production, to the production of a book, uh, Reproductive Sexual Reproductive Rights, uh, Islamic Perspectives of Sexual Reproductive Rights. That book has been a game changer. It has been a game changer. The central part of it, which really caused most contention and kept people away, apart from Western education, uh, not to book around, just Western education, was family planning. The, when the book was launched, or before the book was launched rather, there had been a series of discussions, series of meetings, and it appears that one way to get across, when the ulama now were convinced, the question of how do we disseminate it? And 
funny enough, one of the things that if you said we want to do family planning because the population was getting too large, so she could, they said, bunk up. The Almighty Himself, who, who created the mouth, will feed it. Population control was not an issue. You, in fact, offend sensibilities. Then you said, oh, poverty, so you can feel that you offend, offend sensibilities. The simple route we finally got that worked well was to use religion itself to convince the people. Fortunately, Sharia, which is the Islamic law, gives a lot of emphasis on welfare and looking after your children, looking after your wife, and your wife looking after your husband. So we said, if you had a wife who was beleaguered or belabored by having too many children and she's no longer healthy, are you looking after your wife? If you have children that are weaklings and not being properly looked after, are you really uh, uh, enshrining Islamic principles? So you can see, uh, it's, it's half of, half of uh, six dozen, or, 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 or sorry, it's half of, uh, it, sorry, incomplete information. So if you cannot bring children, you can't look after. You cannot suffer your wife to get your babies. And therefore, you've got to balance the welfare of your wife, yourself, your family, so you have a healthy family. That sells. Any one time it sells. You avoid talking about population, you avoid talking about, which you must mention in the long run. But if you can get them to really limit the size of population from their own families by spacing, which, which is actually mentioned in the Quran itself, if you look, listen to the injunction, you should have about three years spacing in the long run. It mentions two, two and a half years, but in the long run, you'll have up to three years to your kids. And then at one time, you can always, you can always stop, you can always, because the Prophet himself practiced the interrupt method. So it, in principle, you can plan your family. So with that breakthrough, things started, uh, the, the trees started falling, but it took a while to see the effects on the woods. Now, like I said, Sharia was a king thing. The essence of Sharia, you can talk about cutting hands and go forget about that aspect. It's welfare. Whatever you want to do, if it does more harm than good, then it is not accepted in Islam. So if you now start seeing statistics of girls that are having early marriage and abortion and uh, VVFs and so on and so forth, and then show people who have finished their school and are healthier, graduates that are healthier, and you're able to convince them, then really you don't, you, you just, your work is done for you. And this is what we did. Now, one thing that came very fortunately, I'm fortunate but unfortunate, was the issue of polio. It was the same bigotry that got polio lasting till today. But I'm mentioning it because the structures it left behind and the way we went around the issues it raised uh, contributed considerably to making family, I mean, making reproductive health well known and well practiced. So, for example, in polio, uh, I'm sorry, I, out of modesty, I would, uh, I would put modesty aside and say, I've never really tried to emphasize this, but Moji might remember. Um, we discussed with uh, um, Professor, well, Professor, what was the minister called? The one that went to UN, UNFPA. Well, um, so we discussed, and the first thing he became minister, of all things, was to come to Kuala State and straight to my palace. He came with the primary health care boss then. And we had a chat. And just fortuitously, I mentioned, but if you involve traditional institutions a bit more, we're close to the people. And I couldn't believe it himself. His AS secretary of primary health care, suddenly involved the policy and involved the Sultan, and we all had this meeting at which we now created what we call Northern Traditional Leaders uh, Committee on Polio and Primary Health Care. Now, it went on from primary health care, so we met regularly, discussed issues of polio, and every issue we discussed had a collateral uh, 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 positive effect on reproductive health. First of all, was polio safe? We had to go and find it had no uh, anti, anti, what do you call it, fertility agents in it, and so on and so forth. And so that boosted confidence because issue of fertility was an important issue. Eventually, we had now a good network of traditional leaders who we now use in primary health care to look at issues including reproductive health. And we focused shortly after that on maternal child health and maternal mortality. And that was emotional. We could always discuss, we could always show women that are dying. Because, so that gave us a more, another hang, angle into getting into uh, reproductive health issue. The structure became very useful. 
Now, in polio, we had all this issue of uh, advocacy, sensitization, mobilization, M and E, and that was eventually put to good use. Now, what does it mean to do, um, or, or did I get involved in? The issue of um, gender violence, issue of women education, and so on and so forth, um, obviously came very important. It's always important. Now, we, we formed uh, an organization, well, okay, in addition to what we've done in Nigeria, we formed a, a global organization, African Wide Organization, Committee of Traditional Rulers of Africa. And we put this squarely on our agenda, and we're working on it at the moment. You'll hear more. The Dialogue Coordinating Council, which is a big body, in addition to the female one counterpart, did a lot of work on the issue of reproductive health. Now, uh, on my own side, I got very interested in ch girl child, uh, gender based violence, and democratic dividends. They're well interwoven. If we must progress in this country, you must pay attention to the health of the girl, empower her. That is only half of the population which has been neglected. In addition, reproductive health is very important. It's been shown that if you can you know, get the reproductive health regime well applied, you will save a lot more in terms of uh, wasted lives and also healthier women, fully empowered. And we can now, we're well on the way with education to get democratic dividends. So education of the girl child is very important. Now, issues about Child Health Act, Act came into being age of 18. Once again, we said, stop arguing about age of 18. It's not an exact science. It is a guide. So please drop the issue of age of 18, but don't go too low below 16. In fact, you can marry at virtually any age. Oh, don't say fine, but please don't, don't marry a child. Just feel about it as a child, whatever your reason. But then the easiest way to really enforce it was to make sure the domestic laws are such that the girls must go to school. If you can enforce girl education, then by age of 18, or, or when they're finishing their secondary school, you need to say too much. Though even some of our friends who we shared experience with in East Africa will wait until you're 21, which is a bit excessive on our side because we're stretching patients. But that we have noticed works. When a girl goes to school, and she's forced to remain in school at the age of 18, because of most of the problems of early marriage, uh, marrying a girl child, uh, abortions, unwanted pregnancies, and so on and so forth. It mitigates a lot of it. And therefore, you're, you're better in the long run. Now, the, there's always one small area here. Uh, when young girls get pregnant, and then you want to punish them, and punish the, uh, punish, sorry, punish the, 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 uh, the, the, person who perpetrated it, you'll be shocked. They come and beg you, or you get great fines and so They come and beg you in the long run. They beg you and say, please, uh, I want to marry her. And if you find me, I cannot pay this money for the dowry. Uh, so, so it's a catch to two situation. However, every case is taken as own marriage. What um, my table mentioned about Bangladesh was really what I call um, the turning point, in the issue about approach to family planning. Now, um, I can go on, but let me just try. I got I've been given just about five minutes uh, or five, eight minutes. Now, the pandemic is a thing to watch. It has thrown up challenges. The use of ICT has made a lot of things easier. So how we can talk like this, that we can meet expensively. But at the same time, there are now rooms for, a rumor, a rooms for a lot of rumors, a lot of conspiracy theories. And I'm afraid it might set up a lot of our programs back unless we actually actively think about how to work uh, against those rumors. For example, even routine realizations is, you know, is, is in danger unless we really, really proactively work now you know, against what all the uh, conspiracy theories are flying around. People are beginning to express some, some doubts and issues. Now, um, I will try to simply end up by saying there are a lot more I could say, but we just started. Uh, I wish to congratulate uh, the father of reproductive health in Nigeria and also the um, Pathfinder International for all the trouble he's taken, for the pioneering efforts, and for being an NGO by excellence. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Over to you, Moji. Kindness. 
Hello. And, uh, yeah, what thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Did you hear? Did you hear me? Did you hear me at all? No, I didn't hear. I didn't hear the last thing you said. Well, I I, I know that this conversation continues. And um, knowing who His Royal Highness is, we would always knock at your door to ensure that we find the pathway to, uh, to meet the needs and aspirations of uh, Nigerians, particularly at the rural areas where oftentimes they feel left out. And I like the fact that you also spoke about um, uh, the need to encourage more inclusiveness in whatever we are doing as a people. If we leave the uh, half of the population behind, then we will not accelerate as fast as we want to. And thank you for the mention on infodemics. Infodemics, I think uh, people say it's even faster and kills faster than uh, the pandemic that we have to deal with. But I'm sure that Pathfinder will find a way with it as the rest of the world is doing to ensure that the right messages are the ones that are communicated to everyone. We are moving on and we are uh, celebrating Pathfinder International Nigeria at uh, 55. And our next speaker is one that, as a woman, I am very, very proud to uh, uh, introduce her before she makes her uh, contribution. She is Presently, the amiable president of the National Council for Women's Societies. She's also a multi-talented uh, leader of note. Um, according to the research on her, she manifested early in life the determination to bestride her environment with the tenacious resolve of a winner. And so she's a pathfinder herself. Uh, in spite of cultural uh, obstacles placed on the way of education of the girl child at that time, Gloria Lara Bashoda weathered the storm to get to the pinnacle of Western education. From the time she left primary school in 1968 at St. Peter's Kaduna, there was no stopping her until she crowned her craving for knowledge with the golden trophy of a doctorate uh, degree. She's an educationist for excellence. Uh, Gloria Lara Bashoda did not only saturate herself with all the necessary degrees in education from teachers grade two to NCE to bachelors of uh, education to masters, PhD grade to a doctorate. She also took steps to expand the frontiers of learning for the younger ones by establishing nursery and primary schools as well as secondary schools for them. She was born in uh, Kawu, Kaduna State, Gloria. Today is with us, and she has shown so much passion since she assumed office as the president of the National Council of Women's Societies. She's also a member of the National Institute, which is the hub for all the policy uh, uh, brainstorming and getting it right that she has also excelled. Uh, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce and invite to the microphone Dr. Gloria Lara Bashoda, President uh, National Council of Women's Societies and member MNI. But please remember your questions should come to the Q&A box. We are expecting them and we'll deal with them. For now, let me share the space with Dr. Mrs. Gloria Lara Bashoda, MNI. You have the mic. Uh, thank you very much, Moji, my sister and my classmates in the secondary school. Um, good afternoon, everybody from this part of the world. And I'll say congratulations to uh, Pathfinder at 55. Uh, up, up until now, uh, people that are talking were all experts in the health uh, sector. I'm going to talk from a layman's uh, perspective. But before I go into my topic, I'd like to tell you what NCWS is. NCWS uh, is the umbrella body of all Nigerian societies, groups, individuals, whether grassroots or, or professionals. And uh, the organization was founded in 1958, so it's an old organization. And we cut across 36 states and the 774 local government areas of Nigeria. We work with 
different women, we have different athletes, health, education, all walks of life. And um, I'd like to say that women in Nigeria are the key engines of development and we run the microeconomy. So whenever there's any recession or things, it is the women that actually hold this country. Um, talking on my, 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 my topic here about health services, we have done interventions in many areas. I've seen um, um, Dr. Salma there, we have worked with her. I've done family planning, immunization, uh, female genital mutilation, uh, BVF with Ford Foundation in Kano, um, sexual and gender-based violence, which is the, in the bo uh, front burner right now, we're working, uh, human trafficking, child labor, and so on. We're everywhere because we are the umbrella body of all um, women organizations. Talking on my uh, topic, uh, ex uh, the experiences of women in assessing uh, sexual um, reproductive health services in Nigeria. I'll just go straight to what uh, the challenges are, because a lot of people have talked about it. The Royal Highness has told us a lot of things that uh, uh, women are experiencing. But I would just say a few things that I have listed here. Cost of health care. In Nigeria, health is supposed to be free, especially the SRH is supposed to be free for all women. But unfortunately, even in the government hospitals, people pay money. A lot of people pay. You pay for this or that. You're asked to go and bring money for one thing or the other. So it makes it very, very difficult for the grassroots women who are the rural women to access these services. They also they pay for, for post-abortion care, they pay for postnatal care, they pay for nearly everything. It is something that we all know about. So that is uh, uh, limiting the access to women because those people, those women that are poor will not be able to access these uh, services. Then we have a problem of waiting time especially in public health facilities. Sometimes in the, in the hospitals, you have maybe one or two doctors. So the women have to wait for a long time before they can see a doctor. And you know that a lot of these women are daily income women. They sell, they buy and sell. So they have to feed their family. It's what they sell today that they take back home to feed their families. So the waiting time is a problem for them. So they decide to say, well, I can't, I can't go and waste my time waiting for a doctor, so I better not go to the hospital. So that is one of the reasons why um, they, 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 they are not able to access these services. Then we have four um, roads. A lot of the roads to the rural areas, even in the cities, not only rural areas, are very, very bad. A lot of women find it very difficult to come to health um, uh, facilities, especially maybe in the headquarters of the local government from their villages. And it is worse for pregnant women because they are pregnant and for them to uh, you know, find their way on the rough roads of, uh, of, of the community, it's really, really Herculean for them. So a lot of them prefer not to bother going to hospitals. And you know, the bad roads can lead for pregnant women, can lead to complications. They can go into labor on the way going to the hospital. They can have stillbirth or even, or even die on the way because the roads are bad and, 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 and far away. We also have nutritional problems, you know, ignorance and poverty. A lot of people, when you talk about adequate diets, they believe that it has to be very expensive food. You have to go and buy very, very expensive food and eat. That's when you have adequate diet. But ignorance is, uh, uh, um, is making them not to understand that even in their backyards, their vegetables, their fruits, and all those little, little things you have in the villages are very, very adequate for nutrition. So because of ignorance and lack of... Uh, knowledge, 
people decide to, to, to feel that they don't have the money for good nutrition. That also contributes to high uh, morbidity, morbidity and mortality rates among women in Nigeria. Women also are attended by unskilled personnel in private hospitals and sometimes also in, in public. Some hospitals, they don't have good hands. They don't have um, well-trained uh, personnel. They just manage. Maybe they have their, um, what do they call this, uh, nurses that are not, um, auxiliary nurses are there. So in place of uh, the uh, qualified nurses, Sometimes they put the auxiliary nurses to, to treat the women. So all those things uh, are things that, uh, that inhibit uh, the access to good uh, services. Some women patronize quacks, especially in the villages. When you are, when you maybe, when you are even an auxiliary nurse, they call you doctor. So women decide to go to you and take treatment, uh, you know, they, they, and they are quacks. And in most private um, hospitals, especially in the rural areas, most of those people that have chemists and all those um, small clinics are really quacks. They are not, uh, they are not uh, trained. So that also is a problem because women are looking for cheap alternatives. They are not able to go to um, government hospitals and they want to get treatment. And uh, so they, they go to such people. These are many more contribute to the high mobility and mortality rates in Nigeria. Then during this pandemic, this is our novel COVID-19 pandemic, there were have serious uh, problems in uh, sexual reproductive health services. A lot of problems, women really suffered. This pandemic brought a lot of health, uh, health problems to women. Health facilities were health facilities were permitted only few people to, to, to run the facilities. There were increase in home deliveries because people could not get to the hospitals. Uh, there were low turnout of postnatal services such as immunization and so on because of the lockdown. A uh, high number of un unwanted and unintended pregnancies because of rape and all sorts of sexual problems that were happening. Some, uh, because of the lockdown, a lot of women became pregnant. Their husbands are always at home. And uh, of course, some, some uh, young ones became pregnant, unwanted pregnancies. Um, there were high recorded uh, cases of rape and sexual assault. Um, a significant increase in domestic violence and wife battering was also recorded during this lockdown and being, you know, hurried up. All these and many more occurred because of the lockdown and the effort of government to curtail the spread of the dreaded COVID-19. We have a lot of recommendations here. I hope we have time to, 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 to read everything to you. Government should uh, therefore enforce the policy that maternal and child health care should be free at all levels. Funds allocated for maternal and child uh, care should be dedicated to that and also released and disbursed in a timely manner. Funds that, that are for maternal uh, and child care purposes should be given to them and it should be complete, not in pieces or in, 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 in small, uh, the, uh, some of them will be diverted to other places. They should be for, for the purpose of what the funds were meant for. Um, there should be frequent capacity building and training of health workers. Um, a pr provision for the training of uh, resident ad hoc health care workers in rural communities to attend to emergencies should be considered because of the, the state of our roads. There should be more and improved outreach services to the difficult to reach communities, such as in, in improvised health centers in those communities. There are places that are in corners far away. They don't even know what healthcare is. So we should have uh, outreaches for those type of areas. There should be uh, adequate uh, community mobilization to sensitize women on the importance of adequate diet 
by health workers, relevant NGOs, CBOs, and community leaders and spiritual leaders. Healthcare workers should be equipped with adequate uh, PPE and should be motivated, especially those assigned to rural and hard to reach areas. They should give them some motivation. You know, the pandemic is, uh, is not, it's very scary. So some motivation should be given to health workers so that they will be able to, to work and then protective equipment also should be provided adequately. Um, sensitization by all stakeholders should be intensified on the dangers of rape and the resultant consequences. It is, uh, I don't know whether it has become a normal in Nigeria now for rape to just be everywhere. Nobody is spared, the children, the babies are not spared. Even the old women are not spared. Rape is just all over the place. So we should intensify our uh, interventions, our sensitization, and also the punishment for rapists and what we should do with the victims too. They need help. Government agencies are mandated to orientate the citizenry and they should be vocal and sensitize the, pop the populace on the resultant consequences of domestic abuse. You know, because of this COVID-19, a lot of people have lost their uh, jobs, uh, there's so much anger, there's poverty, so domestic uh, violence is rampant. So we should be able, those of us that are um, NGO uh, personnel, work, uh, health workers, we should be able to work together to sensitize people so that there will be less violence. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shoda. I know that for you, you can go on and on about speaking of experiences of Nigerian women in accessing uh, sexual reproductive health services in Nigeria. It's a tough one, but uh, thank God for uh, Pathfinder and other partners, and of course, what uh, National Council of Women's Societies is also doing. Well, we are not there yet, but we are 55 years still trying to find everyone particularly those that Dr. Shoda spoke about, those who live in hard to reach areas. We'll continue to speak on this and advocate seriously to government and of course individuals because it's a collective responsibility. Well, we'll just have a short break and uh, please remember that please uh, send in your questions and to the Q&A box. But for now, I'd like to invite us to enjoy this spoken word, which I'm sure encompasses what uh, Pathfinder has been able to do and uh, moving forward, what they would also continue to do. Let's have the spoken word. Let me tell you the story of Heroes Walk of path textured with trails of blood, sweat, and hero dust. Bear like truth, worn on the arm. You will always find heroes there, holding forth and threshing the field in peace and conflict alike. Pathfinder Nigeria, 55 years of raising hope like a banner. Pathfinders, forging calm out of every storm, you will find heroes here. Whose names hold the breath of a mother, who come from a generation of strong women that bit their tongues, spoke their truth with blood in their mouth. Every palpitation tells a story. The stomach of my mother housed a library, and I became the custodian. I read in her sighs, in her smiles, her tears, silent cries, and in her overzealous joys. I read every chapter, every line, and I became the compendium of everything in between that somehow was a reason to be silenced. That was the culture she brewed in no path, and she never dared to walk. Somewhere in the depth of Dumbulbi, Zamfara State, the body of a girl child is merchandised, 
She doesn't put a price on it, but it's the price she pays for being an ignorant man's daughter. Trades her off, loses her childhood, forcefully becomes a bride. No path. She dares not walk. Somewhere in the creeks of Nembe, by Elsa State, in Nigeria, an expecting mother's dreams are a nightmare. She is pushed on a wooded barrow to the nearest health facility, 10 kilometers away. With a trail of blood turned ocean that leaves a story in the sand of time. Yet another victim of negligence, whose path to motherhood disappears. Somewhere, a boy child inquiry is raised to believe that a woman is nothing but a slave not a partner, an object of pleasure, not treasure. Somewhere, in the hills of Obanliku, Cross River State, a wife is laying helpless on the hospital bed from a placental abruption. This woman, buried in the heart of silence, with a broken smile, visible from a mile, she's traveling memory lane, questioning why she walked down the aisle. Every move she makes is a call for help. She is but a shadow. There is no path. Yes, there is. Pathfinder. Theirs is a war of prints. With every step taken, fearlessly marching forth, you will see Pathfinder in the heart of resilience, overcoming every storm right in the face of fear, where the need is greatest, whatever it takes. <laughs> this path, this path, they must create. There is a girl somewhere whose destiny is assured. A woman whose prayer is answered. A mother whose broken smile is crescent, stretches her hand to be held and be by her side. You will find Pathfinder in the weaving excellence of service delivery within the strands of zero buyers. You will find Pathfinder in the heart of Niger, the warmth of Enugu, the eyes of Lagos, and the embrace of Gombe. You will break free from the shackles, maximizing your potential. You are glory, and you won't inherit your mother's pain. Because this path, we will walk together. You will find Pathfinder here, staring warm appreciation in a heartbeat. For the health workers, we called them nerds, ignored their hazards, but today, they throw themselves to the front line, battling an enemy unseen, the COVID-19, with limited protection, serving their nation. So we say, a silent prayer for Pathfinder. We say, thank you for walking this path. Pathfinder International, breaking boundaries, saving lives. Indeed, breaking boundaries, saving lives, Pathfinder at 55. Now, breaking boundaries. At this moment, I just want us to have just a short reflection of people that have also crossed the path of Pathfinder, those who have rested today in the Lord. And just this brings to mind uh, Professor Babatode Ushotime. He said he believes in the power of the youth. For him, it was important to achieve the aspiration for a better sexual and reproductive health that we need to bring young people to uh, work with us. Though gone, and I'm sure resting, we can still remember him and all those that have passed who have pushed on and given us the courage to move on as a people. Thank you for your souls. May you continue to rest at peace. Now let's come back to the legacy. And the legacy is that youths, when empowered, 
can do very, very serious and big things. And it is on this premise that I'd like to invite Precious Aslem. Aslem has been involved in community development and social work, HIV intervention project since 2012. He has worked with various organizations uh, on different projects. He is an educational psychologist by training and currently the program coordinator at the Youth Friendly Center at Uje uh, General Hospital here in Abuja. He wants to share experiences of young people in accessing sexual reproductive health services in Nigeria. And oftentimes it is assumed that the young do not need this and they sure need this as well here from Aslam. Aslam, welcome. And you have the microphone. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, it's been a pleasure to be here, and I must confess that I think I'm the youngest um, on the panel um, panelist. Um, quickly, I'll just dive into my se section. Um, for everybody that I've spoken so far, thank you very much. Wonderful presentation. Um, sitting down, going through memory lane, even before from before we were born, um, things that people have done, um, um, Pathfinder has created in Nigeria, and it's actually been. Um, wonderful to sit down and go through all of this. So quickly, I'll be talking about the experiences of young people in assessing sexual reproductive health services in Nigeria. Um, contrary to the popular saying that young people don't like assessing um, sexual reproductive health services, um, the fact is young people assess services when the services are professional, friendly, unbiased, uh, non-judgmental, and accessible. As a young person myself and a healthcare provider, I have encountered various challenges trying to Access sexual reproductive health services and provide such services to other young people. The fact is young people are not uh, uh, a uh, homogeneous group and so it's not a one size fit all kind of um, thing. What works for a young person in a do state might not work for another young person in choir state. So the, the, the fact is it is important for programmers and donors to tailor um, their interventions to the specific needs to, uh, of identified populations of young people. So talking about the successes we've had so far in Nigeria, uh, we, the AAYSHR um, community, have made giant strides in the area of improving the quality of health of adolescents and young people. Organizations like Pathfinder International has supported other young people um, by building their capacities to be able to make informed decisions over their sexual and reproductive health and utilize contraception in order to delay pregnancies and maximize their full potentials. They are also partnering with other organizations and um, NGOs in Nigeria to see that adolescents and young people can advocate for their own sexual and productive health and family planning to ensure favorable policies, budget releases, and visibility of the issues. So it's been, um, for me at the Youth Friendly Center, it's been um, a wonderful um, eight years. I've been there since 2012 when the center was commissioned by MacArthur Foundation. And I must confess that um, putting that clinic in place has really helped um, in um, bridging the gap between service provision and service delivery for young people uh, in, in, in Nigeria. Uh, so, but some of the challenges we've encountered um, in the course of providing such services and in the course of young people assessing sexual and health services in Nigeria, one of them is cost of services. Um, when you look at it, um, adolescent and youth-friendly health services uh, in Nigeria is not totally free. In some facility, um, they are subsidized, but in most facilities, they are not. You still end up paying for it. And young people, are, um, are, are not, not all of them are working, not all of them are, are financially stable and independent. So a lot of the time, this um, stands as a barrier for them to access such services. And you also look at distance of the facility. Um, from some of the rural communities to the urban communities, where some of these facilities that provide adolescent and youth-friendly health um, services are domiciled, you discover that it, it's actually quite a distance and not every young person can be able to make that trip because of the cost implication. So a lot of the, a lot of the time they're up for services that are closer to them, um, available options. Uh, they make use of those ones because they cannot um, assess the, 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 the facility where these are domiciled. And you're also looking at the availability of services. Now, not all um, um, SRA services are available in all the centers. You might come to a center where there's contraception available and um, HIV is not available. 
And so at the end of the day, you discover that a young person that wants to get tested for HIV and at the same time access family planning might not be able to do both of them in one facility. So availability of services is another issue. Then um, we, we have religious and cultural barriers as one of the challenges that young people face when assessing um, sexual reproductive health services in Nigeria. Um, thank God for the insightful presentation of our royal father. Uh, it, was, um, it was quite a, a good one. Uh, it, it shows that there's been quite a lot of progress, especially on the um, cultural and um, traditional front. But um, prior to this time, it has always been challenging um, from that angle because you're trying to balance cultural beliefs, traditional beliefs, and a lot of the time, these are strongholds that young people hold on to. Oh, in our family, we don't do this. Um, when we uh, we are we are faced with maybe domestic violence of any kind, we don't share, we don't talk to people outside. It's against my religion, it's against my culture. So most of the time you have those little, little things that's challenging. So instead of them to come to the facility where um, they would be um, uh, um, uh, taken care of, they end up not even doing that because um, their religion or culture stops them from doing all of that. And number five, you um, challenges that uh, we have is lack of funding. Um, if you check the funding that is available, we, we, we are grateful for what we've gotten so far and all the um, agencies that have donated funds to service provision in Nigeria, but still, um, there's still a lot of gap that um, we, we, we need to close, which brings me to suggestions and for um, what, what we can do moving forward. See, the fact is um, many young people still suffer challenges in assessing sexual reproductive health and um, yeah, this, this was further buttressed in the facility I coordinate during this lockdown pandemic period. Um, like Dr. Gloria rightly said, um, a lot of young people became pregnant during the lockdown because they were not going to schools. They were not, um, some of them were um, not able to work. So a, a lot of time on their hands with very little to do with it. And a lot of them turned up pregnant. And in the facility where I work in the last three months, we saw a 20% increase in number per week of complications arising from post-abortion between young people aged 16 to 21. So a huge 20% increase just in just three months for post-abortion complications. That, that shows um, uh, the, the lockdown wasn't all that favorable to, to young people. This is, this is just in one facility in the suburban area. So we can imagine what the situation would be in the very rural, hard to reach communities and even in some elite urban environments. This is largely due to unfavorable adolescent and youth sexual reproductive health right policies that is still in existence, low quality sexual reproductive health right information and services available in the health facilities, which is further triggered by cost of services and distance of the facility. So like I said, it brings us to way forward for um, Pathfinder, way forward for other NGOs, way forward for the government, way forward for us as individuals and as service providers. The NGO and CSO donor community and the government need to make strategic investment in adolescent sexual reproductive health and build the capacities of young people. And we employ them, we need to employ them to lead uh, um, these interventions because who better to solve an issue than the people who experience it themselves. Number two, the government needs to do better in ensuring that adolescent and youth sexual reproductive health policies are favorable and implemented in um, their entirety and support structures like the adolescent TWG to, to perform its functions fully while also implementing recommendations from the group. When it comes to policy, the fact is, on paper, Nigeria has one of the best policies concerning young people. But how far um, does implementation go? That's another thing entirely. So not just bringing our policies, um, implementing those policies would also help to bridge these gaps that have been identified in the um, challenges. And so finally, to other young people like myself, don't let anyone tell you you can't do it. Keep advocating keep representing, keep making your voices heard at all levels. Um, with time, we're going to get to where we've always wanted to get to as, um, uh, uh, um, as far as adolescent and youth sexual reproductive health rights is um, consigned in Nigeria. So thank you very much for the opportunity to represent the um, um, young people uh, and this very, very important um, um, celebrations and happy 55th. Thank you years, so um, much. Thank you so much, Precious. Thank you. Thank, God bless you. thank you so much, Precious. Thank you. Um, that's, uh, that shows that we all together have responsibility to fast track on uh, uh, sexual reproductive health in Nigeria. And when we talk of 
thanks uh, tracking and uh, ensuring that uh, together we would move um, where the position in which we are. Um, introducing our next speaker is like uh, stating the obvious. Uh, she has all her life been involved in sexual reproductive health and more than anything else at, uh, at the very rural of, of places to ensure that uh, Nigerian women and children uh, get what they need when we speak to health outcomes. And um, um, Salma Anas Polo is a former Borno State Commissioner for Health between 2011 and 2015, served as country representative of, uh, country director rather, of uh, FHI 360. She's a public health specialist, expert on maternal and newborn child health, HIV and overall health system strengthening. She's passionate about delivering of healthcare services to vulnerable populations, especially women and children in emergency and humanitarian uh, crisis situation. She demonstrated this uh, in Medjugorje when she took the mantle of uh, commissionership at the, at, at the worst of times when the uh, insurgency was at its peak. Now she also tried to go to the Senate, uh, but I'm sure that at the time she's done here as Director of Family Health, Federal Minister of Health, she would be ready and Nigerian women would be ready to support uh, this quest to uh, uh, further uh, louden our voices as politicians. So uh, this make woman of many parts and we share a passion, uh, both kids are lawyers. So we, we, we get taught all the legal things that we should say and not say. Uh, it is on this very proud uh, uh, stand that I invite my sister and friend, uh, Dr. Salma Anas Golo, Director of Family Health, Federal Minister of Health, to address us on looking ahead what does the future hold for SRH in Nigeria amidst global threats such as we have global uh, COVID-19. You have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Auntie Mekie. It's a pleasure for me to be in this uh, very great mess, marking the, the 55th anniversary of the Pathfinder, working in Nigeria, and specifically working for women, working for women and girls in Nigeria. I highly commend the efforts of Pathfinder, the board chair, the president, my brother, Mike, whom I met like 20 years ago, 20 something years ago at the beginning of the start of the work of HIV AIDS he described in Benue and Oko. Actually, he trained me. And since that time, Mike continued to mentor me, continued to guide me. So I'm happy, uh, my sister Anina, our Royal Highness, all participants, I'm happy to be with you. Uh, I will just share briefly what COVID has done to us in Nigeria. It has worsened the situation, as we all know. It has affected all sectors of development. But the worst affected, I think, is the health sector, not because I'm a health sector person, but uh, the burden is on our fragile health sector, which we are struggling to develop for several years. In addition to that, the effect is most felt among vulnerable people the marginalized group, and now we have the displaced people, mostly women and children. It has mainly affected them. It might not be directly due to the COVID itself, but indirect causes, which I will talk about briefly. And also women as caregivers, they have been greatly impacted by the COVID pandemic. So I think um, this is a very good topic to talk about, though the time is very short. But before I talk about COVID, I just want us to recall where do we stand Nigeria in terms of our efforts towards uh, sexual and reproductive health in Nigeria. Where are we? We all know where we are. And we all know that sexual and reproductive services in Nigeria are provided at all levels of care, from primary, secondary, and tertiary, even though with a lot of challenges at the primary health care. We know that a lot significant part of uh, sexual and reproductive services are provided by the private sectors, almost 60 to 70 percent, and they are being out of pocket. I'm also happy to mention that all our health workers, be at any level of healthcare, one way or the other, they also provide care. 
They also provide sexual and reproductive health care to women and girls. And as my president said, NCWS president, Dr. Shoda, a lot of them are called doctors. Significantly, most of them are up to 70% or more in Nigeria. They are the Jews, the health workers, some are even just attendants working in hospital, they're nurses, midwives and nurses and, 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 and doctors. A lot of them are women. They provide health care. They work despite all the harsh environments, despite all the struggles. We've had a lot from Pathfinder. The difficulties, the challenges, but yet they continue to provide services. And we just realized also from our recent survey that over 50% of such health workers have never had any form of additional training or capacities enhanced. So where are we? We are a country that still have a total fertility rate of almost 5.7%, maternal mortality of 512 days per 1,000 live births, low utilization of sexual reproductive health services, especially family planning. The use of modern family planning is still low. So that is where we are and really more. But uh, I think we have made some modest progress if you look at the last 10 years and also at the work that has been done in the past but quite find that they've laid a solid foundation modest progress is being made if you take family planning for instance we might see that for us to achieve our 20 of uh, 27 percent uh, desirable goals it means we have to have a growth rate in family planning by 5.2 percent but looking at it globally the global growth is just about 0.1% and Nigeria is currently at 0.4%. So we are indeed making progress, even though uh, we still have a long way to go. We are still far from it. So talking about COVID, initially we thought it was a story far away from us. Unfortunately, it came. It came in February this year. It came through Lagos to Ogun State and since then it continued to rise. At the moment, we have over 52,000 people infected with the, that have had COVID infection, COVID-19 infection, with a case fatality of almost 1.9%. So uh, what, what happened when it came? Now, almost all the states in Nigeria are affected. Everywhere is affected with the COVID. Initial reaction was reactions, was negative reactions. There were denial. There was panic, there was fear, there was confusion all around the places. The health workers also felt they were not motivated. They didn't have enough protective equipment to protect themselves. There was disruption of services, restriction of movement, there were lockdowns. So these are, these are, the, these are the, some of the issues that I said had indirect cost, uh, impact on women and girls because health workers stopped providing services in most cases, even at the tertiary healthcare facilities, patients and clients were turned back. But we should also remember that even at that time of the lockdown, women continue, couples continue to make babies, women continue to be pregnant, and also they continue to have babies at home. And we also recognize even before COVID, our, still, our delivery at home, under unskilled supervision is still was still very high. So this was the midst of kind of a confusion that happened within the first um, six weeks, up to two months, I can say, of the COVID uh, uh, pandemic in Nigeria. So uh, we started to witness an increase burden on the health sector. And then uh, most services were interrupted. It exposed a lot of girls especially obstetric and gynecological complications, hemorrhage, obstetric labor, conceived abortion, even disruption of HIV and services, treatment and care. At that time also, we begin to record high cases of sexual and gender-based violence, even though services to provide care for those women and girls were disrupted at that time. There was also disruption in the supply chain for family planning, and then women were not even accessing family planning commodities. On the side of also women and girls in communities, they are also afraid of uh, contracting, uh, contracting the COVID infection 
by getting out of their homes. And because of the lockdown, they also thought services have uh, fully been disrupted. So all this happened at the initial stage, and I uh, we strongly believe it has uh, made a big impact in terms of a negative impact on the sexual and reproductive health services in the country. So uh, what we did, so much happened. Immediately what we did was uh, we tried to look into our data, available data to us, the NDHIS, the Nigerian Family Planning Dashboard. Of course, even data reporting grossly reduced as of that time, poor reporting. And then, uh, but we use what we have to get information. And then we started engaging with all the focal forces to see uh, the impact. And what we realized in a summary is that um, yeah, the COVID pandemic has uh, truly exposed the weaknesses in the health systems. It has also um, shown the unsystematic, not too good, uh, kind of coordination that we have, linkages between uh, governance at all levels of care, and also the technical delivery, both demand and supply side. Human resources for health also uh, begin to also um, ask for their demands in terms of insurance, in terms of what in other motivation packages and so on and so on. We also realize a huge funding gap and then uh, increased numbers of pregnancies, early marriages also happened and then uh, increased cases of uh, abortion. We've talked a lot about infodemics. Fake news continue to go around so easily leading to denial, rejection of services and several other complications. So what happened that time? Immediately what we did was to ensure that we sustain our essential services in the country. And the Honorable Minister through the National Council on Health immediately uh, directed that all essential services, services around reproductive, maternal, newborn and child health, including nutrition services in the country should be sustained at all costs. All facilities should maintain and then we begin to develop uh, guidelines, training manuals, started all the strategic engagement and then ensure that um, all focal persons on the productive maternal, newborn, and child, including family planning and adolescents, uh, focal persons are fully uh, integrated within the uh, COVID pandemic coordination response at the national and also at the state level, so that when they uh, develop programs and then when they also uh, discuss uh, about services interruptions. When they begin to divert, what I didn't mention was diversion of health workers at the initial stage. They realize that uh, women are still uh, need to access services and children. So uh, services were retained and then health workers working specifically at RMNC are not uh, redistributed since after that uh, incident within the first two months. So this was what happened. So a lot of efforts happened, a lot of guidelines happened, and then there was some um, redistribution also of our family planning commodities. The first quarter happened, the second quarter happened. And then there was a mop also of our financing within, within the health sector. So there was a big struggle and an advocacy. I really appreciate all those that were involved in advocating to ensure that uh, the budget line for essential services were not cut and diverted to COVID response, including family planning budget line for 2020. It still remained as it is. So we continue also to restructure the flow of patients and clients within the facilities. And then to address the issues of the fake news, denial of services, there was an aggressive campaign on risk communication and management. So a lot happened as of that time. Uh, unfortunately, also even youth-friendly and adolescent services were interrupted, but all these um, were reinstated. And this also included the engagement with the community leaders and also our religious leaders at all the levels of care. So this in a nutshell, this is just a summary of it. And then we started also to work on our COVID response uh, RMNCH plan, which became part of the overall uh, health sector COVID response plan in the country. And we are working, we work with partners to develop those plans. And this is currently ongoing. But I think that the most important thing is that uh, we've learned a lot of lessons and then uh, we've also realized a lot of opportunities within the COVID pandemic, even though it is still evolving. We realized that the weak health systems that we have, it also enabled us to have a better understanding on how COVID impacted on us, SRH, including family planning, what changes within the short period of time 
and also what we expect to happen within a longer period of time. So uh, these are some of the great lessons we've learned. We've learned also the disconnect and then the poor coordinations between the tertiary secondary facilities and the primary health care. For the first time also, we realized some of the shortfalls in our policies, in our strategic frameworks, in our SOPs uh, that are non specifically non-responsive to, to gender and also to public health emergencies. So we're able to, to begin to work on that. And then uh, some other areas also we realize uh, limited capacities of health workers, you know, despite their commitments, their zeal to work. So uh, it also provides us opportunity. One great opportunity also we realized was uh, the private sector involvement in the COVID response. The private sector played a very important role in resource mobilization and also getting fully involved in, uh, in, in, in the response, at even not only at the national level, but also at the state level. So these are some of the, the great lessons we have also learned, apart from the negative lessons. We've also seen that weaknesses in the health system was uh, fully acknowledged by the highest level, especially policymakers. Uh, the legislators became very conversant with the weaknesses in the health and are willing to work with the health sector to improve uh, uh, the, the systems. So uh, this gave us a lot of opportunities. And then uh, currently, even um, electrification, which is one of the key barriers uh, of accessing services at primary health care facilities, lack of electricity, lack of security, and several other sort of supply. All other sectors, ministerial sectors, also feel they should play a part in providing water supply, in uh, providing rural electrification to primary health care facilities in addition to isolation centers. So these are some of the opportunities also uh, that um, the sector has gained as a result of COVID. Uh, of course, uh, it's not so much to say, but of course, it has also increased the demand and use of technology, including the virtual meetings we are having today. This is not common in the health sector, I mean, in governance in Nigeria. And uh, it is a strengthening system, and we have seen that it reduces a lot of cost, you know, a lot of savings in that. And I think the government of Nigeria, especially in the health sector, is exploring opportunities to see that this has come to stay in terms of uh, using electronic type technology in the delivery of healthcare. So uh, looking forward from all the lessons we have learned and then the hands-on experience, you know, by doing as the problems are emerging, we continue to address the, the, the problems based on our capacities. It might not be right, but we've also learned how to do it better. And also the, the opportunities that it has fully exposed. So uh, suggesting on the way forward, though it's, everything is still evolving, as I said earlier, is to also um, tailor it towards our policies. Our policies need to be uh, gender responsive, uh, all our policies and strategies, and also our policies need to respond to public health emergencies, not uh, just COVID. We've learned a lot now with the COVID, so it has to also be tailored to ensure that it responds to all public health emergencies beyond uh, disease pandemic or epidemic that may happen again in the future. Uh, another area that uh, we feel looking forward is to build a strong and resilient health system at all the levels of care that will stand the test of time and be able to cope with public health emergencies uh, without disruption of essential services, particularly uh, reproductive, maternal, newborn, and child health services. Also, linkages, linkages between programs, linkages and uh, between um, uh, other programs that are not only health related, for instance, uh, linking uh, sexual and reproductive health programs with wash programs, with nutrition programs. Uh, these are some of the lessons we have learned, and these are areas that we need to take forward to make maximum impact. Also, linking with education, linking maternal health with education. Uh, it remains very critical because we also realize from the few preliminary data we received from the state, most of the affected are women and girls that are uneducated or have lower level of education because women with higher education also uh, make deliberate attempts to continue to access services despite the, the, the disruption of services. So these are some of the ways that we are looking forward. 
we need to also ensure um, greater involvement of men, not only as supporters or advocates for SRH, but also as key beneficiaries of SRH interventions, uh, which is also very, very important to us. We need to also strengthen our engagement with the policy makers, with the, with the community leaders, with the religious leaders, with the legislators at all the levels, including at the state level. Then on GAP, there is need also uh, to invest more in sexual and reproductive health in Nigeria. Uh, the funding gaps is still very glaring. We need to come up with uh, looking at innovative approaches. We've learned so much in here when we saw the contributions of the private sector in the country towards the COVID response. So we need to begin to look at more innovative approaches of engaging private sectors, not only private sector, even community-owned resources to be mobilized and the communities to lead also in terms of uh, response to, to, to that. So these are some of the ways, but there are several others because of time. But I think I have to mention that uh, one key area also that the public has exposed to us, yes, is the quality of care, is the quality of care, which should be an integral part of continuous capacity building, mentorship, and culture, and then knowledge sharing and management to guide SRG. So uh, I have to end it here, even though I've not said everything I want to say, but uh, it's, 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 uh, I think for us to hear more and celebrate Pathfinder on the work that they have done. And uh, I want to congratulate everybody in Pathfinder. Those fab that founded Pathfinder at the beginning of it, those that initiated and even thought of coming to Nigeria to work, and those that have continued to work in Pathfinder, including the beneficiaries of the work of Pathfinder. I want to say a big congratulations as we celebrate the 55 uh, birthday of Pathfinder being in Nigeria. Thank you so much. I'm looking Thank forward you. to continued collaboration. Thank you very much, Dr. Salma Anaskolo. I know that um, this will be an ongoing collaborative effort uh, Pathfinder and uh, the department, your department, Family Health of the Federal Ministry of Health. Okay, we've heard the chat box has been bustling, and so also has been the Q&A bustling with, uh, you know, wanting to have clarification, wanting to know what's happening. So at this moment, we are at Q&A. So it's an interactive session, but um, just want to say that I have some of the questions here, some are related, and uh, some would um, really will we'll try as much as possible to address them. First, the first two questions that came is uh, someone, uh, Adamu Yarima, who wants to know if the uh, if Pathfinder is supporting the government of Nigeria in the area of demographics, maternal and child health in the northern part of the country, going by the high statistical burden of maternal child deaths in the region. I can say to you that Pathfinder is also uh, working in that part of the country. And um, truly, uh, if you send, well, these are questions that and, and answers that we can send to you. You send in your email and let you know where Pathfinder International Nigeria is working and may, uh, maybe any of uh, the interventions might be of interest to you. So Oga Mike, I, I hope you're still with us. And um, the first uh, question uh, for our panelists will go to you, sir. And um, this is from, uh, he did not, I don't have his name here, but it says, with the huge efforts and breakthroughs navigated by Oga Mike and the evidence-based efforts currently going on, why has the CPR remained almost unchanged? Is religious and leadership challenge still significant issues in driving poor CPR in Nigeria? The question is uh, from for you, Oga Mike. I hope you're still there. Please, can you uh, unmute and? Uh, oh, thank, yes. Thank uh, you very you. much. Thank you very much. It's a very good question. I'm still here. Um, I think um, the short answer to that is. Uh, Nigeria passed into law the National Health Act five years ago, and that health act has not been fully funded. So funding is an issue, you know. So when you don't have funding, then continuity becomes a problem. 
Uh, the other thing is the, unlike those days when funding was sustained over time, we have more epileptic uh, funding of activities today. But I think the most important thing is that health, we need to be on the front corner of political agenda, which means our National Assembly, like when COVID came, I saw questions being asked the other day uh, by the speaker saying, oh, how are you paying her staff? All of a sudden, because everybody is involved and everybody is affected and affected by COVID, nobody is accepted. I mean, exempted, health is now getting attention. So when we get attention and we get focused, and then we actually monitor it down to the grassroots level, mobilize the uh, communities to uh, make them know that they know it, but they have priority, you know? And so I think it's resetting priority. It's, the answer is, is funding, is political agenda, is refocusing that will change the dynamics of where we are today. Um, thank you very much. Um, maybe uh, Dr. Amina would like to give further insight to that answer. Is that it? Okay. Um, well, I would um, just have one more question for, uh, and this will go to Dr. Salma. Yeah, Dr. Salma, the question is from Akirutimi Akirumi from AF. He would like to ask, with the advent of global data, what is the future of SRH in Nigeria in terms of data collation and capturing, whereby is a centralized data capturing mechanism for all diseases and RH? Um, that's the question, and it's for Dr. Salma. Thank you, Moroti, and also um, from Platform App. Yes, I think uh, the way to go, of course, it is to improve on our data management and also data capture at all the levels, up to the lowest level of care. And I mean by that, uh, the PAC and also even the full health host level. I think what we have learned, as I said earlier, is that uh, we have improved capacity, you know, with the technology because of the COVID. Because the first meeting we had with our family planning for persons from all the states, we didn't know it would work and it happened virtually. And then we also stepped down to have up to the local government level. And I can tell you the, the, the percentage of uh, attendance was almost 90%. So I think that is the way to go. And then using also technology to, to, to improve delivery of services. But at the same time, we also have to have to be mindful so that we don't create uh, inequity. In, uh, in access to services because, of course, there are still uh, challenges. There are still a lot of Nigerians below the poverty line that will not have access to, to services to be able to also be captured. So, of course, it's still work in progress. Thank you. Work in progress and um, Pathfinder and the rest of us uh, ensuring that uh, hopes are restored and we can all together dream of more, um, more interventions and more milestone, uh, counting 55 and looking forward to another robust 55 years. Now, we'll move straight to uh, the uh, closing remark. I would like to say that uh, for all of us, Please, your questions will be answered. You can send in your email addresses and would we'll ensure that the experts would uh, get back to you on that. That I can assure you will happen. That is, uh, and, uh, you know, you can take that from me and because you will get your, your, your questions answered. But we, our time is almost up. And at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, the host and the country director Pathfinder International Nigeria, Dr. Amina Aminu Doraye is a public health professional with extensive experience in designing and managing health systems, strengthening and maternal, newborn and child health programs. While she's currently today the uh, Nigeria Country Director for Pathfinder International, where she provides overall strategic leadership and oversees the program, programming 
uh, the programmatic and operational management of Pathfinder International activities in Nigeria. Well, that was uh, 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 a mouthful. But to me, she has also exhibited such leadership that has debunked what everyone says that when you put women together, they do not work. She has demonstrated with what I have seen that with women working together, you'll even get faster results. So let's give it up to our chief host for today, Dr. Amina Aminu Durai. You have the microphone. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, um, our moderator, uh, the president and board chair of Pathfinder International, our distinguished speakers, esteemed participants, and my tireless Pathfinder colleagues. This year is actually a very special year, not only for Pathfinder in Nigeria. It actually marks a milestone for the sexual and reproductive health landscape in our country. Since 1965, the sexual and reproductive health ecosystem has evolved significantly from one that was largely blind to the unique health needs of women to one that recognizes that for individuals, especially women, to lead a productive life, the highest standards of health, and in particular, sexual and reproductive health, must be secured. PASFA is driven by the conviction that all people, regardless of where they live, have the right to decide whether and when to have children, to exist free from fear and stigma, and to live the lives they choose. And we're guided at Pathfinder by a quote from Antonio Machado that says, traveler, there is no path. Paths are made by walking. And I would add that at Pathfinder, for the path to remain clear so that others can follow, all the thorns the traveler meets on the way must also be removed. In the last 55 years, many committed individuals have made significant contribution to the development of sexual and reproductive health landscape in Nigeria. Some of them are alive to witness this progress, while others are no more with us to participate in making, marking this momentous occasion. But without these gallant heroes, they would certainly have made no path for sexual and reproductive health in Nigeria. Even though these heroes are too numerous to mention, in a few minutes, such as this webinar, we thought it necessary to recognize them by presenting their names here for you to see, and we call it the Pathfinder Hall of Fame. And I salute all heroes, these heroes that you see on the, on the um, presentation. Without them, there would certainly have been no path for sexual and reproductive health. The topic for today's webinar is quite timely, and just by the number of participants that joined us, it is certainly one that many wanted to learn more about. And this may be because for us to make significant progress, especially in SRH in Nigeria, it is critical to understand where we came from so as to learn lessons from the past, identify and build on what has worked, and make improvements to approaches that may not have resulted in desired outcomes. The speakers of today have, made, have done justice to this topic. Personally, it was really very emotional listening to Oga Mike's exploits and his team in the pursuit of community action for sexual and reproductive health, and also the contributions of respected traditional leaders, which was presented by His Royal Highness, Dr. Hali Ruyahaya, who has also been at the forefront of successfully eradicating polio in Nigeria. Congratulations, sir. We also heard about the experiences of women and youths through the voices of the president of the National Council of Women's Societies, Mrs. Gloria Shoba, who is herself a family planning activist, and Precious Anslem, an ambassador for young people who has dedicated his time towards ensuring his peers get the much needed services they deserve. In Nigeria, we say the voices of our leaders are actually the voices of wisdom. So we greatly appreciate Dr. Salma Anoskolo for taking time out of her busy schedule to share with us the Federal Ministry of Health plans for sustaining the giant strides made for women, young people, and families, especially in vulnerable settings, and also to continue to ensure access to quality health services even during pandemics such as COVID-19. Despite the successes that have been recorded in Nigeria, 
maternal mortality is still very high, as Dr. Salma also noted. Or met need for family planning is at 19% and only 39% of women deliver in a health facility. We therefore have a responsibility to continue this work even amidst emerging health uh, and environment threats. Considering the diversity of the stakeholders that Pathfinder has worked with over the years, it is clear that no one government can do it alone and no one organization can support the health system and communities to achieve greater success without collaboration. And this entails working with both the public and private sectors, community structures, faith leaders, and women groups, youth organizations, civil societies. And the efforts, of course, of many local and international development partners cannot be overemphasized in this long struggle and journey. And going forward, this kind of collaboration, as well as other new and innovative partnerships need to be harnessed to ensure our health system is resilient to future shocks that impact on SRH services. And I think looking ahead, we have a responsibility to build on these efforts and ensure that Nigerian women, youths and families have the highest standards of care that they deserve. And Pathfinder is committed to, to sustaining these gains in collaboration with all the partners, government stakeholders and community participation. And um, this is because there are too many women, too many children, and too many communities that need a better health system and access to better quality services. But certainly two hours is not enough to share all that has happened in 55 years. So I urge you to visit Pathfinder International social media handles for more information about the various projects that were implemented, the lessons that were learned, and our current and future priorities, especially in a fast changing world. So on behalf of Pathfinders, all Pathfinders, past and present, I say a resounding thank you to all Pathfinder heroes for, this, for toiling this path. Thank you to our esteemed speakers and our able moderator, all of whom have been part of this journey. Your readiness to spend time and share your experiences is much appreciated. And we cannot really thank our donors enough for the generous support that made all these successes for possible. We're actually looking forward to add more 55 years of touching lives together. To my colleagues, thank you for accepting me into the Pathfinder family. I am so proud to stand on your giant shoulders and collectively to create more paths. I enjoin everyone that found time to join us today to make a commitment to support at least one woman or young person through everything, awareness creation, service delivery, anything that we can. But once again, Thank you for taking time to participate in this webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day and God bless. Thank you. Thank you indeed. Thank you everyone. And thank you our great participants for staying through. Uh, that's the commitment of Pathfinder. Stay through, walking through and ensuring that we restore hopes and better the lives of our women and children. For me, this has been an honor and a great opportunity to be associated with such a solid and people-friendly uh, uh, organization. Pathfinder, thank you on behalf of the Nigerian media. And I can say this, that we'll continue uh, in our struggles in our, uh, well, haven't, haven't stayed in the trenches for a while, but we have results and these results have been the motivation for a whole lot of us. We will see a day and we would continue in the path to ensure that better health, access to health, better funding, improved human resources, improved facilities are, the, are what people of Nigeria would get. That way Pathfinder truly would have lived up to its name. Thank you for your contribution and thank you all the beautiful participants. I can assure you that your answers to your questions will come on and we'll ensure that uh, we just leave your email address and of course uh, visit like uh, Dr. Amina has said all the social handles for you to get more information on what Pathfinder International Nigeria is doing. My name is Mujima Kajola and I'm pleased to have uh, navigated us through this, I'm sure that you have, you'll enjoy the rest of the day. For everyone around the world, thank you for your participation. And for uh, Abuja residents, enjoy the rest of the evening. It's cool, it's wet, and showers of blessings on all of us. Have a good day and God bless. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.